好 ，Good morning everyone。咁多位早晨啊，咁我哋嚟緊呢就會開始呢個 section 啦。We're going to begin this section immediately, and the topics will be influence of documentary theatre today.、Uh, why making documentary theatre? And today we have、uh, Nick and Robin as our speaker today, and they're going to present for around like thirty, forty minutes. And after that, we will have a Q and A session.、Uh, if you have any question, please raise up your hand in the Q and A session, and you are free to speak in either in English or Cantonese. Not a problem at all. And, and today I'm the moderator. I'm Sim Sim. Okay, nice to see everybody. I think we can start, Nick. Yeah. Morning, everyone.、Um, I'm so enjoying this conference. It's terrific. Thank you so much for inviting me. I loved the session, especially yesterday afternoon, which I thought was very challenging. And it was great that the audience had so many questions too.、Um, I spoke yesterday about my belief that theatre could change society, and today I'm going to try and describe the methodology of my work. But I must stress, this is my approach to documentary theatre. There are many, many other approaches which are equally, if not more important. Robin's approach is completely different from mine, but we're all working towards the same goal. I think all of us can agree that documentary theatre, in an age of false news, becomes more essential every day. My work has evolved over time into three different methods of using verbatim to make theatre.、Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the first method, well, rather lengthily about the first method, and then go on to the other two methods. In 1994, the first of the plays, and I mentioned it yesterday,、um, that the British press called the Tricycle Tribunal plays. Was a public inquiry edited by the Guardian journalist Richard Norton Taylor, and it was about the arms to Iraq sales. From the very beginning, we formulated a number of strict rules for our type of verbatim theatre. Firstly, we were going to try and avoid bias and present both sides of the argument as fairly as possible. A lady in the audience yesterday said, "There are always two sides of the story. We were trying to present both sides. Some bias was unavoidable in the Senate hearings I showed yesterday, as it was the Democrats predominantly that asked the difficult and interesting questions, and those featured more in the play. If we just stuck to the Republican questions, there would have been no play." Also, the mere fact we've chosen the subject about which we make a play tells everyone that we feel there is a case to answer. Secondly, we would use transcripts from the inquiries and stick exactly to the words that were spoken and to the exact chronology of the proceedings. We might slightly edit a question that was asked, but we would always make sure that we delivered the answer that was given. Even if that too was edited. Thirdly, anything we added to the text would always be put in square brackets in the published edition, and would only be added for clarity, like a date or the spelling out of an acronym, that sort of thing. Fourthly, we would try to simulate the atmosphere of the inquiry as closely as possible. But not to make it theatrical, we would leave the house lights on, so that the audience felt more involved and were part of the proceedings, and it would re-echo what effectively happened at those inquiries. And we would ask actors to try and get the essence of their characters, and to try not to caricature them. Fifthly, we would work on a very, very fast timescale. So that we were always staging the inquiry in the theatre after the actual inquiry's public hearings had finished, but before the inquiry issued its final report. The idea was that the audience could feel part of the debate and make their own judgments before there was a judgment written on paper. Inquiries and Trials usually have very strong narratives. There's almost always a conflict between those asking and those answering the questions. 
Both narrative and conflict are, as we all know, two essentials for drama. Add to that some very strong and sometimes well-known characters, and you're a long way towards a dramatic, thought-provoking and challenging experience in the theatre. I'm going to show now a short excerpt from the first play that Rich and I did together, where Margaret Thatcher is being questioned about whether she contravened her own government's stated policy in 1993 on selling arms to Iran. Um, whilst they're getting it up, um, this excerpt was from the broadcast on BBC TV of the play. And the play itself was performed at the tricycle with 250 seats. And then it became the first play ever to be performed in the Houses of Parliament when a lot of MPs came to see it. Lady Thatcher, uh, I should like to start with the establishment of the guidelines in December 1984. The document is Lord Howe's minute of the 4th of December 1984. I have it. Some of the witnesses we have had have described these guidelines as a, a framework within which they had to work or as a hurdle which exporters had to cross in addition to other existing constraints upon exports. Does that fit in with how you saw the guidelines? They are exactly what they say. Guidelines. They are not law. They are guidelines. Did they have to be followed? I beg your pardon. Did they have to be followed? Of course they have to be followed, but they are not strict law. That is why they are guidelines and not law. And of course they have to be applied according to the relevant circumstances. But they are expected to be followed. Of course they need to be followed. They need to be followed for what they are. Guidelines. The Ministry of Defence Working Group assesses and decides that the equipment will significantly enhance the capability of either Iran or Iraq to wage war. In those circumstances, can the equipment be granted a license for other factors, uh, such as encouraging exports? We would not, I think. I say we would not. I was not involved in the actual application of these guidelines. I was involved in the policy. The precise question was, Miss Baxendale. I am sorry. You are more familiar with this. I have seen so much paper that I have never seen before. I was concerned with the policy, not with the administration. What I was asking you about was, if you have the Ministry of Defence Working Group saying the equipment will significantly enhance the capability of either side, can other factors such as employment in the United Kingdom override Guideline 3? I do not believe you would ignore the guidelines solely for exports. Possibly a little caricatured, Mrs. Thatcher. Anyway, we tried not to make it too caricatured, but I think it did get a little caricatured there. Um, our next venture together was not an inquiry, but was the Nuremberg 1946 War Crimes Tribunal, which I spoke about yesterday and we saw a clip. As I said yesterday, we opened the evening with a contemporary speech by Judge Richard Goldstone, who was then the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Judge Goldstone's speech was very powerful, and I invited him to London to come and see the play. He graciously came to see it, and we had dinner afterwards, and he was very insistent that I went to his court in The Hague to see the United Nations Rule 61 hearings on the massacre at Srebrenica. These Rule 61 hearings were called the Victim's Charter because they allowed the prosecution to lay out a case of war crimes in the absence of the person accused. In this case, it was General Mladic. If it was proven to the judges there was a case to answer, then an international arrest warrant had to be issued and that warrant had validity in any country in the world that was a member of the United Nations and a country failing to obey it would face sanctions. And that was the way that eventually General Mladic was handed over to the International Criminal Court. 
Judge Goldstone told me at dinner the courtroom in The Hague would be packed, but he promised their tickets would be like gold dust and he'd get me in. Well, three months later, I flew to The Hague and was astonished to find that I was sitting in a courtroom almost alone. There were four members of the public and five journalists and me. Every night in my hotel room in The Hague, the day's proceedings of the court were covered extensively on Dutch television. This was because a Dutch regiment had been in charge of the UN peacekeeping force in Srebrenica and had failed completely to stop the massacre. However, there seemed to be hardly any other coverage in the world's press or media. Certainly nothing in Britain except one quick mention on one BBC News bulletin and a hundred word article in the Financial Times on the last day of the four days of the hearing. What I'd witnessed in court was terrible. 8,000 people had been murdered by General Mladic's troops in a week. The UN had done nothing. And a few years later, an investigation into the largest massacre in Europe since the Second World War was being ignored by the world's media. It made me so angry that I decided it was essential to do something about it. I quickly made a play from the transcript proceedings of the hearings, and a couple of months later, we put the play on at the tricycle, toured it to Belfast in Northern Ireland, a country riven by similar religious divisions as Bosnia-Herzegovina, and then we took it to the National Theater as well as getting it broadcast by the BBC World Service. There was a certain theatrical irony about this production too. For the, pre -production, for the production, we reconstructed the furniture and special desks that were used in the United Nations courtroom in The Hague. And three years later, the UN rang me up and asked if, they, if we still had the furniture from the production. And I said, yes. And they said, could they borrow one of the desks? Because they didn't have enough furniture for the upcoming trial of President Milosevic, which was starting in the following week. So ironically, a few days later, a United Nations truck turned up at our theater in London to take our desk to The Hague. And it was a real case of art mirroring life and then life mirroring art. Um, we had no particular plans to continue pursuing these tribunal plays, but two years later, there was an inquiry into the death of Stephen Lawrence, a young black boy who'd been murdered by some white racists, and the police had completely messed up the investigation. It was clear that because the Tricycle Theatre was in such a racially mixed area, that we should tackle this inquiry. It was a must for us. But Richard, my collaborator, was less sure. He had a day job as defense correspondent of The Guardian, and his time was precious, and he was a bit overwhelmed with work. But when some of the suspects gave evidence to the inquiry, their arrogance and racism caused demonstrations and almost a riot, and any doubts he and I had about staging this play absolutely vanished. I'll just show you a clip of it. Now, before anyone else asks you questions, I want to ask you one or two of you said that you were willing to help in so far as you can by speaking the truth. Yeah. As to the racism attitudes of yourself, and particularly your brother and the others, having seen the surveillance video, you must know that they showed the most terrible racism. Do you not know that? I cannot speak on, uh, on behalf of people. No. You have seen the film? Yeah, I've seen it once and it's a long time ago. The only warning I will therefore give you is this. You have immunity in connection with the matters uh, which have been investigated in the past. But if you commit perjury, you may be prosecuted. Do you realize that? I understand that. I understand that. Yes, Mr. Mansfield. The 3rd of December, 1994, you're in custody, you're not there. It's 11.30 at night, 
going to ask you about a specific passage near the beginning of the transcript of the video. A strange ironic coincidence, football is the topic of the day. Luke Knight complaining about the commentators wanting the Cameroons, fucking niggers, to win. Your brother says, makes you sick, doesn't it? Neil Acourt says, whilst picking up a knife from a window ledge in the room and sticking it into the arm of a chair, says, you rubber-lipped cunt. I reckon that every nigger should be chopped up, mate, and they should be left with nothing but fucking stumps. Now, Jen, you forgotten that? Yes, I have, yeah. Well, now that I've reminded you of that, and there's plenty more in that vein, shocked, are you? Honest reply, please. I ain't shocked, it's nothing to do with me, is it? I ain't shocked. David Norris is saying, I go down Catford and places like that, I'm telling you now, with two submachine guns, and I'm telling you, I take one of them, skin the black cunt alive, torture him, set him alight. And a little further down. I would blow their two legs and arms off and say, and say, go on, you can swim home now. And he laughs. Neil Acourt, your brother, says, just let them squirm like a tit in a barrel. Do you find all this shocking? I have no comment on it. You do carry knives in public, do you not? No. In January 93, the police stopped you. You were found in public with a folding lock knife, were you not? I can't remember what they asked. Had you forgotten that you possessed a weapon in public? No, not until you mentioned it, then I remember it. The inquiry itself lasted for 18 months and we had to condense it in two hours. It was not shown on television until our version of the play, recreated from the BBC by, from our stage production. The play got huge audiences in the theatre. It toured throughout the country, played the National Theatre and got 23% of the national television audience when shown on a Sunday night by BBC TV. It shocked audiences, it opened up a dialogue, created understanding and sympathy between different races in the audience. And it's even been used for the next 10, for the last 10 years as a training tool against institutional racism by a number of police forces. I think it really shows the power of theater to change things. <laughs> Our next tribunal play took us back to the Iraq war. It's given us the subject matter of four of the tribunal plays we've done. Unsurprisingly, as two million British people demonstrated in London against the Gulf War. So it's been a concern in the theater and of, amongst the general population for many, many years. This particular play was about a government inquiry in which the BBC was itself on trial. They'd accused the government of bias and lying in the publishing of its dossier for the public about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and the reasons why it wanted to go to war with Iraq and to the reasons as to why we, the British, were joining the USA in going to war. A well-known government scientist, Dr. Kelly, had committed suicide after it was reported that he thought the government had lied in their dossier. The government insisted on setting up a public inquiry to clear its name and to judge the BBC. And as by now almost all the public inquiries were being televised, we all thought this one would be as well. So we decided not to do it in the theater. However, out of curiosity, we attended the opening day of the hearings and we discovered the presiding judge had other ideas and was not going to allow the television cameras into the inquiry. We were also astonished when we heard in court one of the lawyers using our theatre, the tricycle, to make the case to the judge for the inquiry to be televised. He gave three reasons why it should be televised. One, it would be much more democratic if the public 
could see it on TV every night. Two, the inquiry was about the BBC itself, so surely it should be televised. And three, if it was not televised, a small theatre, the Tricycle in northwest London, would almost certainly reenact the inquiry, and then it would be televised anyway, and the judge himself would be played by an actor. Um, after that, it seemed obvious we had to stage it. And ironically, our stage version was indeed televised by the BBC after its run theatre, so the judge was eventually played by an actor. I'm certain he was disappointed it wasn't George Clooney. Um, can we show the, the, the clip of that? Taking on some comments about the strengthening of language on current concerns and plans, is that right? I think it surely took on some of my comments and none of the Prime Ministers on the structure. The structure stayed the same and some of the detailed points he took. But if we go back to um, Cab 1169, Mr Powell's comments, we will need to make it clear in launching the document that we do not claim that we have evidence that he is an imminent threat. Is there any part of the, uh, the dossier that makes that explicitly clear? Well, I know that what we always said was a serious and credible threat to the region and therefore the stability of the world. And at cab 11103, at Jonathan Powell's email to you, the third line down from the top, Alistair, what will be the headline in the standard on the day of publication? Well, search me. But if we go to BBC 490, we can see what that headline was. 45 minutes from attack. <laughs> Did you have any hand in this headline? No, I didn't. I do not write headlines for the Evening Standard. <laughs> now to the second strand of my work, the, the, the different way of using verbatim. In 2003, I went to a public meeting hosted by the famous British actor Corin Redgrave and his sister Vanessa Redgrave. They were leading the protests about the imprisonment indefinitely without trial by the Americans of five British nationals and six British residents in Guantanamo. This was a terrible injustice and no one was doing anything about it on stage, although actors were leading the protesters. There was some coverage in newspapers, but not enough. I was conscious that up until now we'd been dramatizing inquiries and trials, um, but I thought, why not make our own theatrical inquiry if no one else was going to do it? I did try and get some opera companies interested, but no one was interested. Um, I telephoned Julian Slovo, who is a friend and a novelist, and up until now had never written a play, and suggested that instead we, of a play that I had commissioned her for, we did a verbatim play on Guantanamo. She took some persuading, but finally agreed to do it with a journalist friend to help her. We started at the end of January, interviewing relatives in Britain, and the relatives of those being held in Guantanamo, and lawyers who were acting for them, and also judges and politicians who were acting active in the campaign to close Guantanamo. We also searched out public statements by American officials who were prepared to defend Guantanamo because no one was actually prepared to be interviewed by us on that subject. Less than 12 weeks later, we opened a play that transferred to the West End, eventually ran for six months off Broadway in New York, was used as a campaigning tool for, riding, for readings in 25 cities around America. And in New York, Archbishop Desmond Tutu came to New York and appeared in the play for two performances. He then had dinner with some friends, mutual friends of mine and his, and told them he'd been in it for a week. So uh, bishops sometimes exaggerate. Um, the performances caused huge publicity for the campaign, and this is an excerpt from the um, U US production of it. After two days, we were taken back to the Gambian Secret Service HQ in the interrogation room were the two Americans in front of me and the two Gambians beside me. And they went over the whole thing again and again about the business, about who did I know. Then when they were finished with the business, they asked fanatical questions. 
What did I think of Mr. Uh, now what is his name? Not the Taliban, the Qaeda guy. What is his name? Bin Laden. I said, I don't know Mr. Bin Laden. You probably know him more than I do. You trained him. <laughs> they asked me, do I know any terrorists? I said, of course I don't know any terrorists. They said, we think you have come here to do so, so, and so. I said, that is stupid because there is no basis for that. One idea was that we had come to the Gambia to set up a training camp, the Division of Labor, as follows. I was to be the cover. I was to run the business. My one partner, he was to keep an eye on me in case I did something wrong. He was to be my policeman. And my brother, because of his skills, he was supposed to be the trainer of the camp. I said, have you found any training equipment or military stuff? They said, no. I said, my brother, he is supposed to be coming here to uh, train people, but he only has a visa for one month. How can he set up a camp and train people in one month? So at the next meeting, they brought another fear. We were supposed to come to Gambia to blow up something. I said, okay, okay. I said, name two targets in the Gambia that are worth blowing up. <laughs> All of the British nationals and residents, thankfully, have now been released without charge or trial. This new departure into producing our own inquiries proved to be extremely fruitful. We had to choose our witnesses very carefully, but it was surprising how many very influential and famous people were willing to talk to us and take part in these plays. We again made certain ground rules. Everyone had to agree to be recorded for a lengthy two-hour interview. We would send them the recorded interview and they could check it and even remove anything with which they were unhappy or withdraw it altogether. But once they had checked it, we warned them that after that, we would be editing the interviews into much shorter versions and they would have no further control of that. Everyone seemed happy with that basis and we never had anyone who withdrew the interview or complained afterwards. Um, we did have one or two people who wanted to alter the odd sentence and we asked them to actually re-record it with us so it was in their own words rather than a written bit of um, rubric because it would sound wrong within the interview and everyone agreed to that. We also made sure that we reacted very, very quickly to events so that from the moment we started working on one of these plays until the moment they reached the stage, it was usually never more than nine months and usually more than, less than 12 weeks. We used this method to stage a trial of the Prime Minister Tony Blair for the crime of aggression in Iraq, we recorded evidence from some very well-known international witnesses, but we did make a bit of a diplomatic blunder by using his wife's legal chambers to record the proceedings. The minute she discovered this, we were thrown out. Um, we also used a similar method in August 2012, which produced when we produced on stage three months later in November, um, and for which two cabinet ministers and the police were prepared to give us, us evidence. Although the, and this was a play about the riots. Although the rioters were more difficult to access because if I then identified, they'd go to jail. And we knew who they were. And if, sorry, and if the police knew who they were, if, sorry, if we knew who they were, the police might force us to reveal their names. So it was very difficult to get evidence from the rioters themselves. However, we found a film company um, who had talked to them and kept their identity secret and we used that evidence from the film company, that verbatim evidence. Here is an excerpt describing how the riots began. The kids threw a few fruits and things. Nothing happened. They then got emboldened. They decided to get up to the cars and start to smash the windows. See, they were frustrated. And the police cars represented a symbol of their frustration. So they just went to it. And you could see it was in stages. You could see it was like, let's throw things at it. They're not doing nothing. Let's smash it. They're not doing nothing. Let's open the doors and let's see if we can get out the CS gas canisters. 
So that's what they did. They took out everything they could take out of it. And they kept looking at the police. And it's like, wow. They're not doing nothing. These kids have never seen this before in their life. They're used to getting stopped before they do something. So they steal everything in the cars. Nothing happens. They then get emboldened. They decide to push the cars out into the road. And it's almost as if the kids are saying, well, okay, they must not be able to see us. So let's push the cars into the middle of the road and they can see us. The police did nothing. So they decided to set the car on fire. Set one car on fire. The police did nothing. So they rolled out the other car. And when they rolled out the other car, let me remember, was it on fire or not? No, it wasn't on fire. It went across the road into a shop, a, 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 a Kurdish shop, a, a Turkish man shop. The Turkish guys came out and to call to the police. Hey, look man, look at this car, they just pushed into our thing. Even then, the police just stood there. They just looked. Turkish guys pushed the car from their shop front back into the road. And then the you set fire to that car. The first I heard was when someone, or one of the police support unit commanders, who've undergone training in public order policing, found me to say, are you the on-call? We've got problems here. Yeah, there's a, there's a police car on fire, there's a barricade being built, and we've got serious issues. I was incredibly surprised. So I asked the first question, which is, is this a wind-up? Which he said, no, this is legit, it's happening. I said, right, in that case, that's fine, I'm on my way. I'm in South London and get a message that it's kicking off in Tottenham. I'm like, I knew it. The most recent use of this method was when we did a play, Gillian and I, um, which we proposed to the National Theatre about the Islamic radicalization of young Europeans who were going to Syria to join and fight with Islamic State. We looked at why they were becoming radicalized, the effects on their families, and how the authorities could deal with the problem. The National Theatre commissioned us to do six months research, and with eight, in eight weeks of our delivering the play, they had it on stage in a full production. During the research for the play, I'd spent one day interviewing seven mothers in Belgium who'd lost their children when they'd gone to fight for ISIS. It was one of the most emotional and difficult days of my life, but it yielded a bit of the play that you will see. This excerpt is at the end of the play when one of the Belgian mothers living in Brussels describes how she went to Syria to find out how her son was killed whilst fighting for ISIS. I went to the Syrian border, so to Kilis in Turkey, where it's really the gateway to get to Aleppo. And I went out there with my son's clothes, in fact. And over there you've got all the Syrian families who are trying to get back to Syria. And I gave my son's clothes to a mother who also had a boy. And I said to her, here, my son wanted to help you. And with his clothes, in fact, it's a second chance for him to help. And the mom said to me, but how can you do this? I said, yes, because my son wanted to help you and so I am helping you too. And I had a little bit of money and I gave it to her because she was going through some tests because she was ill and she said to me, no, you shouldn't. I said, yes, I should because it's my son's money and this way my son is still helping you. And uh, the mom was pregnant, in fact, and she said to me, what was your son called? I said, well, his name was Anis. And she said to me, 
My son, I will call him Anis. So, inshallah, now there is a mother whose son is called Anis. There. That's the mum's story. During um, rehearsals, we went to Molenbeek to visit the mothers who gave the interviews for this play. Yasmin, the woman that I play, wasn't there. We learned from the other mothers in the support group that in December, Yasmin had found out her son had been in the Paris attacks. He'd blown himself up about 500 meters from the Stade de France. Yasmin's trying to get his remains back to be buried beside his father. It was a great shock to us when we went to Belgium and found out only 10 days before we opened that Yasmin had left the group of supporting mothers because she had found out that her son had actually been one of the people that had been blown up. The um, set off his suicide belt in the street outside McDonald's, outside the Stade de France. Luckily, he hadn't killed anyone but himself, but it was um, rather a terrible revelation and we couldn't find a way of putting it in the play except the way we did at the end. Those are the two methods I've used. The third method I've used with the verbatim is not to put it center stage, but without it, I don't think I could have been brave enough to stage some of the more ambitious work I produced. Sometimes over the last decade, I felt verbatim by itself was slightly constraining. And more recently, I felt challenged to produce work on big international political issues. And although a verbatim allowed us to hear many different viewpoints, it never strayed beyond the facts. It never offered the opportunity to unleash a dramatist's imagination to range freely and to tell a story from the past, present or future that might have its own special inspiration. So I started to use verbatim as an explainer and more importantly, as a backup or a fail safe for some larger projects. Just to give you some examples, in 2009, I became very curious about the role of Western imperialism in Afghanistan since the first Anglo-Afghan War of 1842 up until the present day. It was a very large canvas, and when I conceived this project, there were British troops fighting in Afghanistan alongside those of many other countries. But what I didn't know was this was the fourth time in the last over 150 years that the British had been fighting in Afghanistan and we, like many other international powers, including the Soviet Union, had always been defeated there. So I commissioned 12 playwrights to write 30-minute plays retelling the history of Western involvement in Afghanistan since 1842. And I planned to intersperse with these plays some small pieces of verbatim from journalists, soldiers, politicians, historians, and the Taliban if I could get them to talk to us, to help knit the 12 plays and six hours of drama together. This also meant I could have the courage to commission these plays and announce the production before the plays were even written. I could do this because I knew that if the worst came to the worst and only 10 of those plays were good enough to present, I could fill in the gaps by expanding the verbatim 
to cover the history of Afghanistan that was missing. In the event, all the plays did work out and I didn't have to do them. But here's a trailer of the plays where it shows how we knitted in some of the verbatim between the six hours of each play. I'm not going to show you six hours. Um, this trailer was used to publicize the American tour, which also played two special performances for the Pentagon in Washington. In the trailer, um, I've expanded slightly the verbatim that we used, just so you can get a better of idea of how it was used. The plays are just in very, very short excerpts. It lasts about three minutes. Thank you. There you are, Sir Mortimer. There is your map. Take good care of it. The lines of it may be imaginary, but the problems they cause only to real. You'll be fighting because of them for many years. It is our job to fight cheap wars so that our people back home can live expensive lives. There was a mistake. It has been an expensive war. We want the Islamic Sharia law and Islamic regime to be here. And the people who are right for the running of the country should be appointed. We want to get rid of nudity, adultery, corruption, insecurity that has been brought by the Karzai government. We want Afghanistan to be the leading country in the Islamic world. This land is painted with the red blood of millions martyrs. No superpower has ever owned here or defeated us. Our fathers crushed the Russians and the British. Those historical events are still fresh in our memories. We will defeat the current superpower of the world, the Americans, and NATO forces, so they will never, ever look back at our country. The great hope for Afghans is for order, not building a Valhalla, not importing Western ideas, but for Afghans to organize to meet their own demands for stability and prosperity. The principles of good governance are as innate to Islam as they are to Christian societies. The key to moving forward is to build accountable and legitimate institutions to bring in accountants as well as policemen and build on the national solidarity program I helped to design. It's a network of every village in the country. Each one gets a block grant. They elect their village councils and manage their own funds. The money goes straight to villages and is spent by the villagers themselves. We need to revitalize the economy. That means kick-starting agriculture, fixing an irrigation system. There are some that question whether a victory for the Taliban will lead automatically to a resurgence of Al-Qaeda-inspired terrorism in the UK and other Western countries. Can we be certain that it will not? Historically, it happened. The relationship between the two today is just as strong. And consider the hugely intoxicating impact on Muslim extremists worldwide of the defeat of the USA and NATO, the most powerful alliance in the history of the world. There's a village north northeast of Geresh called Mazdurak. It's deserted as far as we've known. It's now considered a possible insurgent base. They're closing in, aren't they? Seems it. Many, many innocent lives have been and will be lost in this war. But I, I, I truly believe it should not stop you from sending your daughter to school. We Afghans always make the same mistake. Ah, oh, shit! Jesus! <laughs> Jesus! Well, you've never been under fire before, have you? No. Um, the general talking there was the head of the um, chief of the defence staff in Britain and head of the um, commanded the NATO for NATO and ISAF forces in Afghanistan, and the other person was a Taliban leader um, who was speaking at the beginning, who we managed to get a telephone call with, and he's one of the chief leaders of the Taliban. Um, I had a similar experience with a series of plays I conceived putting plays together and using verbatim to knit them together about the history of the bomb, including a play about um, North Korea, which would 
be quite timely if we'd revived it now. Um, and that was um, eight playwrights and um, four hours of plays. And then um, my successor at the tricycle, at my suggestion, did a whole series of plays about women, power and politics, where she also used verbatim to knit them together. And she said to me, what happens if some of the plays don't turn up um, well written? I said, well, use verbatim, put it between. And that served her quite well because one of the plays didn't work out and she had enough verbatim to make the evening work. Anyway, enough from me. Thank you very much. And I'm very, very pleased to be beside Robin because we hosted two of his plays at the Tricycle. I'm a terrific admirer of his and I think his play, Welsh play, whose name escaped me for a second, was one of the most powerful plays um, I've ever seen in the theatre. Thank you for listening. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. It's your turn. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Mm. 1995. I've written just five little things in this book which we will come to in time. The first one says J.P. Somerset. The second one says Bale Hostel Leeds. The third one says William Butler Yeats, who is an Irish poet. The fourth one says only that person could tell that story, so let them tell it. And the fifth one says God is in the detail, and we'll get to all of these in time. In 1995, I was in a production of Volponi at the National Theatre, on which no expense was spared. Uh, it starred Michael Gambon and Simon Russell Beale, two internationally known actors. Uh, the cape I was wearing cost £12,500. It was made of sable and made in Paris. <coughs> and every night, 1,200 or 1,400 people, whatever the Olivier Theatre in the National Theatre in London holds, came to see this play. It was very well received, but in light of what happened next, in a way, the audience owned us. Um, it was a very well-heeled audience at the National Theatre. Sometimes somebody would say, well played, in the middle of the performance, as if <laughs> David Gower had just stroked the ball elegantly to the mid-wicket boundary, or they were tasting a glass of wine. Oh, it's rather good, the uh, 97, isn't it? Yes. And in many ways, you did get the impression that although they, they were listening and attentive, they were partly at the theatre in order to be seen to be at the theatre. And uh, in a way, we were, in the old sense, actors who were there to entertain them. And there was one occasion, in fact, when somebody sent a note backstage saying, would Mr. Gambon and Mr. Russell Beale kindly be more understandable in the second half. And uh, so you, you get an idea of the, the sort of way that the audience treated the whole thing. Halfway through this production, I got a telephone call from the Royal Court and there was a young assistant director called Mary Pete. She said, Robin, I've got these 23 speeches from a German writer called Klaus Pohl, and it's called Waiting Room Germany. And this is 22 monologues and one duologue, which have been, their interviews with people five years after the Berlin Wall has come down to see how their lives have changed. And we want to stage a reading one afternoon. Are you free? And I said, yes, I'm not busy till the evening. So she said, we'll come in one day next week and we'll have a little rehearsal in the morning and then we'll have a staged reading in the afternoon, which is what we did. And it was extraordinary. I mean, uh, oh, the good and the great from the Royal Court came to listen to it and left suitably impressed. Well, probably the end of the story. Except at that time, at the Royal Court, they were doing a play by Nigel Williams and one of the lead actors walked out and they had to start rehearsals all over again. Uh, but it meant that the Royal Court was going to be dark for a fortnight and they didn't want that to happen. And then somebody had the bright idea, well, look, we had that reading of that very powerful 
German play, Waiting Room Germany, why don't we stick that on for a fortnight? Now, it just happened in those days that at the National Theatre they played in repertoire, so if a new play was coming into the repertoire, you had a fortnight off. And it just so happened that the fortnight that they wanted to have off to put Mother Courage in, into the repertoire to go alongside Volpone, was the fortnight they wanted to do this play at the Royal Court. So I was free to do Waiting Room Germany at the Royal Court. It was rehearsed in six days, no set, just a chair at the front of the main stage at the Royal Court. And we would take it in turns to sit in this chair and tell these stories to the audience. And the difference, the no production values, no capes costing 12,000 pounds, no revolve, no flambeaus whizzing around the back of the Olivier, no. An actor sitting in a chair and talking to the audience, and the effect was electrifying. We owned the audience. And when I say <clears throat> we, I don't mean me, Robin. I mean I was the conduit between the character that had given this speech to Klaus Pohl and the audience. And actually, to answer something that came up yesterday about what sort of actor is needed, why don't you use a real person? Well, Actually, actors have a wonderful technique which, is, which enables them to be a wonderful conduit from what is on the page to the person in the audience. They have a skill at doing that, which probably a lay person wouldn't be able to do, just in terms of diction and their voice carrying or the way that they're used to coping with an audience. And, um, but of course, it does require a simplicity from the actor not to get in the way of what is on the page and in order to deliver it as clearly as possible to the audience. But that audience was electrified by that work. You could, you always know as an actor whether you have an audience's attention or you don't. Whether they're fidgeting, looking at their watch, whether they prefer to be in an Italian restaurant, you can always tell whether they're in your grip. And in, in those monologues by Klaus Pohl, they gasped, they laughed, they cried, they sp spontaneously burst into applause when something good happened to the character, they gasped when something bad happened to the character, they were hanging on every single word. It was electrifying. And I had never, ever in my whole, what up to then, 35 years of acting, had never known such a keen attention to what was being said on stage. And I said to Stephen Daldry, who was running the court then, this is an, an extraordinary form of theatre. And it became clearer to me when I went back to Volpone after doing Waiting in Germany for a fortnight, that I was back to the oh, yeah, this is rather good, wasn't it? Should we go and have a gin and tonic together? Come on. <laughs> you know, it, 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 was, it was apparent, the difference between... And I said, well, we should explore this form of theatre more. And he said, well, why don't you try and write one? So I went, all right, I'll try and write one. And I wrote a play called Across the Divide, which wasn't very good. Uh, it was a bit lumpen, a bit crude, a bit overlong. I hadn't really got the format in my head. Um, but uh, it was about the general election, the landslide election in 97. And I just went round my constituency and I tried to choose as many opposite voices from the social scale, from an economic scale, from political standpoints that I could possibly find and mould them together into this play. It sort of half worked. And um, I sent a copy to Max Stafford Clark, who's a director I had worked a lot for as an actor. And he sent me a postcard back saying, well, I've always enjoyed this sort of writing and I found this very perceptive and insightful and interesting. Uh, that was the end. That, as far as I was concerned, that was, you know, that, that had gone. I know what's going to happen next. In 2000, Max decided to uh, revive a play called Rita Sue and Bob Two by Andrea Dunbar, which was set on the Buttershaw estate in Bradford. And it's a, it is very nearly a verbatim play in its own right. Um, this is a story I like telling, but when he said to Andrea, why did you stop that scene there? She said, well, they went round the corner, I didn't hear what they said next. So 
Um, and it was very autobiographical, this play, and it did recall scenes from her childhood, but she was almost still a child then when she wrote it. And I thought, oh, so anyway, I was doing a play at the Soho Theatre, and uh, Max came to see it with Mark Ravenhill, who's another well-known playwright. And um, I arrived downstairs, and I went, oh, God, I'm glad I didn't know you were in Max. I'd have been very nervous, even more nervous than I was anyway. I'm, I'm glad I didn't know you were in the audience. He said, oh, well, I'm taking you out to supper because I'm going to talk to you about something. And I thought, oh, no, he wants me to play the drunken father in Rita Sue and Bob too. And... Um, I said, well, anyway, Max, I've, I've got some friends in. He said, oh, fuck your friends, come and have supper. And I said, but I can't be that rude. He said, no, oh, just wave at them and then come and have supper with me. So we went down to the road, had supper. And he said, I'm reviving me to Thu and Bob too. And I said, oh, here we go, he wants me to play the drunken father. And he said, but I'm going to do it with a companion piece called A State Affair, and you're going to write it. Sorry? He said, I'm going to do it with a companion piece called A State Affair, which is set on the same estate, the Buttershaw Estate in Bradford, as Andrea's play. And it's what happened to those sort of characters 18 years after she wrote her play, which has gone through mass unemployment, the Thatcherite years, the mass introduction of cheap heroin, and more or less disaster for those people. Uh, you, you want, you, you, sorry, you want, you want me to... Yes, you're going to write it. Well, anyway, he said, um, so we go up to Bradford for a fortnight's workshop on the 12th of July. Then you have six weeks to write the play, two weeks for rewrites. We go into rehearsal on the 12th of September in Liverpool and we open on the 23rd. Right. So, there I was suddenly as a verbatim playwright going up to Bradford with a team of six actors, Max the director, a couple of facilitators. And what happened was we would, we would start in the morning, all of us in a room, and we would plan our day. You're going to meet a social worker, you're going to meet a headmaster, you're going to meet a policeman, you're going to go to an old people's home where they do Pilates to keep people going. You get the idea that we have a team and they can go out now. My particular mode of study is to always use a notepad and pencil, and this is partly due to Klaus Pohl. Because when he wrote Waiting Room Germany, I asked him about how he interviewed people. He said, well, he said, I am putting up the video and this, um, you know, and the microphones and everything like this. I get the people, and after 35 minutes, 40 minutes, they're beginning to relax. I thought, 35 minutes, you've missed everything by then, you know. And then I began to realize that somehow electronics and gadgets and plugging things into walls, actually, it wasn't going to be much use to me going around garages in Leeds and Bradford, you know, interviewing drug addicts who lived in a pile of leaves anyway, because there wouldn't be a PowerPoint to put a microphone in. Uh, so... Uh, Notepad and pencil seemed to me to be, and it's what I'd used when I wrote my um, 97 play, and I thought, let's stick to the notepad and pencil. And also, I want you, as actors, and Max always does this as well, to put on your mental tape recorders. Because the next day, at 10 o'clock, when we all came in to that sort of base in the morning, people would reenact people they had met before, the day before and sometimes unerringly accurately. And of course you then said, well, that, that, that's, that sounds fascinating. Perhaps I should go and meet that person. Maybe we, we should go and... Now, this is where number one comes in because we wrote, we read as our background a, a fascinating book called Dark Heart by Nick Davis, a Guardian journalist who had been around Great Britain looking at some of the darker spots of where, where when Thatcher, Thatcherism lifted four-fifths of our population into a higher income bracket and a higher awareness, it was at the expense of one-fifth of our population who sank into a darker place than they'd ever been before. When she says she united the nation, she united the bit she could see, but the other part was so far over the horizon she couldn't see it and wasn't bothered with it. Which Tony Blair then 
termed the underclass. Um, anyway, this JP, a JP is a justice of the peace, a local magistrate, somebody of great sort of local dignity and worth, and they're elevated to the thing of being a local magistrate and dispensing justice. And he said, oh no, about, about this work, about Nick Davis, about what filmmakers and television makers were making. He said, oh no, not another middle class apologist for bad behavior. When are people going to realize that these people in the north of England get into trouble due to their own innate wickedness? Which was very useful in defining the sort of opinions that I think theater can overcome, because that is simplistic, prejudiced, ignorant, um, stupid, crass, find any adjective you like, but it's not enlightened and it's not progressive, but it, it does, it puts a marker in the sand for, for an attitude that you think, do you know, if, if, if I could write eloquently enough, if I could find the right people to talk eloquently, I might just be able to shift that opinion. Even if it's only an inch, I might be able to shift it. And so there's more to this than meets the eye. So the next one says, <clears throat> Bale Hostel Leads. This is interesting for two reasons. Uh, a, a Bale Hostel is where people who've got into trouble with, with drugs are awaiting sentence and they're put in, it's, it, it's not quite prison, on the other hand it's not freedom uh, and you're kept in this hostel awaiting sentence for usually for shoplifting or drugs or both. And uh, it was suggested there would be some very good stories from young people about how they found life difficult and what sort of problems they faced so we went there. And the man who, the sub warden, of the bail hostel got me into his office and he thought I was some um, posh, um, you know, ambitious, out for my own interests, using northern angst as a position to forward myself as a writer. And he sat down in a chair and said, you, you, never forget it's someone's life. And that has stayed with me always, all through my writing, all the way that I approach my work. I always remember him saying, never forget, it's someone's life. That's what you have in your hands as a creator of this work. You have somebody's life. Somebody has been willing to open up and express themselves in as honest terms as they can, and you it's something very precious that they've given you. And the third one, William Butler Yeats, goes with it because there's just a line in one of his poems which says, tread softly because you tread on my dreams. And that is, along with never forget it's someone's life, a very good philosophy for a verbatim playwright to have in neon letters seven foot high above their desk when they're writing. Uh, so we went round um, Leeds and Bradford, gathering these stories. And I, I want to talk about the Bale Hostel for one other reason. And that is the extent to which we as playwrights, thinking about dreams and somebody's life, have a responsibility to our audience in what we give them, what we present to them, what is allowable and what is not allowable give to an audience. So I met this young girl in the bail hostel and she was a heroin addict and her boyfriend was a thief and a heroin addict and he told her she wasn't to get pregnant but took no precautions when he was having sex with her and she did get pregnant and she tried to hide it from him and when she was about six months gone he noticed obviously that she was pregnant. And he picked her up by her hair and swung her around so violently that her whole scalp came off in his hands. And she was left with just a red, raw, bleeding mess on top of her head. 
When she collapsed on the floor, he kicked her so hard in the stomach that she immediately had a miscarriage and her dead baby came out, which she took off and buried in an unmarked grave and would go every week and take it a plastic toy or a fluffy bear or a bunch of flowers. I decided not to put this story into my play because it's so horrific, it seems to me, that the audience don't have a choice but to be very shocked and quite sickened by this particular story. There was already quite a lot of nasty stories in the play, uh, uh, one of which I'll come to in a minute. But it seemed to me that this is emotional blackmail, this story. The, uh, and actually, it's unfair on the other characters that you're putting into the play, because if you're reeling so much from something that has hit you, in the face, that you probably don't listen to the next three stories, or you're too shocked to absorb something else. Balance, balance is absolutely vital. I call it grim. I mean, you know, just sort of grim in inverted commas. You've got to be very careful with how much grim you put in a play. It's not true to human life to just put nothing but grim facts into a play, because human beings aren't like that. We're much more multifaceted. We laugh in the darkest of times. So. That Bale Hostel also had another great lesson for me, which was not to try and shock your audience into submission, but to invite them to listen. And therefore, if you're dealing with violence and really nasty things, you have to be very careful how much you put in and how much you lace it with something of a different color. Not every composer would have every movement of a symphony in the same key, in the same time, in the same dark mood. You have to vary things. Uh, and then, uh, I, uh, I found, which I probably hadn't expected, that the amount of self-analysis from the people I was interviewing was fantastic. <coughs> there was a boy called Paul, and when the actor who met Paul and said, you have to meet Paul, I said, what does he look like? He took a bottle of water and he just poured it over his head and his shirt and everything. He said, that's what Paul looks like. He is so drugged up, he just sweats. He's just sort of water. He's pale and he's water. Well, we found out that <clears throat> Paul went to the crypt of a church every night to get a free corned beef sandwich and a piece of apple pie and a cup of tea run by an inspirational vicar who, who wanted to do something for uh, you know, people who were homeless and had problems. Uh, but the trouble with Paul was that he was either so heroined up that he was or he was turking. <laughs> but one night, one night, he was halfway between and was capable of speech. And um, I said, will you... Um, Will you come to the pub and, and, and talk to us? He said, yeah, all right. And his analysis of his life and how at the age of 22 he'd ended up like this was searingly brilliant. I, I mean, I, I've listened to psychologists and politicians and all sorts of dignitaries. But this really young man was so brilliantly analytical about what effect his father leaving, what effect, you know, um, his overweening mother had had, how he'd been sent to approved school, um, how he had lapsed into drugs and then theft and then armed robbery and then become what he was today, almost dead, um, because he knew he had a very short time left to live because he'd used up every single orifice, everything vein, artery, everything. He was sticking needles up his bum. He was doing everything to get the next shot. And, um, and he knew he hadn't got long for this world, but wanted, as it were, to tell his story as a cautionary tale. Mother, tell your children not to do what I've done. He wanted, rather like a medieval morality tale, to tell his life in terms that you could, you could see what had happened to him. Anyway, we were sitting in the pub, and he said, Shadwell approved school were the worst place I'd ever been to. He said, they used to beat me all the time with a notched cane. Anyway, there was one day 
He said, I'd had five beatings. My bum was red and raw. I was crying. And this Mr. Ormrod, he said, anyone for Jim? So we all go off towards the gym. And they said, right, lads, let's get the fucker. And they tied me to a metal fence with weightlifting belts. And then it was snowing, and they all picked up these snowballs, and they hurled them at me, one after the other. And I thought, right, go on then, go on, but you'll not make me cry. You'll not make me cry ever again. I'm a father of two. I was writing with my, in my book with my pen, and I just put my hand out and put it on his shoulder because I was affected by the story. And he went, <laughs> and I realized at that moment, nobody had showed that boy love ever, ever, any sympathy, any compassion in his whole life. It was like a 3,000 electric volt shock went through it. Um, I've just been told I have five minutes left, so um, I'm going to have to stop in a minute. Um, but just to finish up, hardly started, I could go on for another five hours. Um, <laughs> afterwards, afterwards, stay after the, the, with us. The, I was, um, one of the actresses said, I want you to meet this woman, I might be seven minutes, wanted to meet this woman who lived on the Buttershaw estate, she's called Julie. And um, I said, uh, right. So I arrived at her house and she said, well, what, what, what do you want me to tell you? I said, well, tell me about your life. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, just tell me your life story. She said, what, all of it? And I said, yes, all of it. She said, what do you mean, right, right, right from the beginning? I said, yes, right from the beginning, till now. So we sat down at quarter past three and we finished at quarter past 11 at night, apart from a tea break and a pee break. And she told me her life story. And the only time I interrupted, number five, so I say only that person could tell a story, so let them tell it, so I let her tell her story. And God is in the detail. And the only time I interrupted was to get more detail, because as Hans said yesterday, when we watched Lord Shawcross's speech from the tribunal, it was the detail that you remembered afterwards, the blood on the neck, the silence, the willingness with which they went into the pit. It, it, it's the details that stick in your mind. And it is the details that make this form of theatre so incredibly powerful because they are, an, they are a, an inviolable link between the characters and the audience go, I know that, I recognise that. That incredible recognition of domestic detail is what binds the audience to... And it's what makes this theatre unique, is the detail, the domestic detail. Playwrights have used it throughout history. And I'm going to read you an excerpt in a minute of, of a speech which is almost entirely made up of domestic detail. But, so, uh, Julie had had four disastrous relationships, three disastrous relationships, and then found the man of her dreams. And they had another child together and her life moved into calmer waters until she found that every night at one o'clock he was slipping out of bed and going and um, having sex with her 10 year old daughter from a previous marriage. She said, my whole, my whole life shattered like a mirror into a thousand tiny shards. I'm writing. I started to drink. I go, what, what did you drink? Abbey Royal. It's like a fortified wine, like a sherry, £2.45 a bottle. Thank you. Great line, you see. Domestic detail. And whenever, and, and her previous boyfriend had said, she said, oh, he wouldn't allow out, out feminine in the house. He said, camo stunk house out. Even the, even the shampoo had to be masculine, like Volzine. Uh, these lines have an absolute impact on an audience. They're both funny and tragic at the same time and intensely human. And this form of theater is able to elicit that sort of detail, which immediately fells us an audience because we stop seeing the artifice and we realize we're right at the epicenter of somebody, somebody else's life. And I just finish with a speech which is almost entirely made up of Domestic detail. This is why I do need my glasses, Nick. 
This is Vitya. This is the Arab-Israeli cookbook, a play that I researched in Israel and Palestine in 2003. And the, um, I was asking Vitya about her visit to the supermarket. And you can almost hear me asking the questions like, what was the weather like? What time of year was it? What did you buy? What flavor was that? What did it which you'll see. I want to be a little bit dramatic. I went with my daughter, she'd come from Tel Aviv. We went to the mall in Jerusalem to buy presents for the holiday of Passover. I remember I bought a black and white blouse for my sister and for my mother, I bought a large ceramic bowl, beige and brown for putting pasta in. So we'd done all the big shop. It was one o'clock in the afternoon. We're in a hurry because it was the Friday before Passover and the shops closed at three o'clock. And I started, oh, no, I haven't got anything to eat for tonight. And my son and his family were coming as well. I'd better nip into the local supermarket and get something for supper. I parked out there at the back and then walked up these stone stairs into the square to get to the front of the shop. It was cold. It was very cold, wintry, a wind sharp like a knife. And we went inside quickly. We passed four Arab women who were sitting on the pavement outside, their heads covered, and they were selling parsley and garlic and fruit. I thought it was encouraging that they were sitting with the Jewish flower sellers. I didn't buy anything off them that day, but before that, I'd often bought stuff off them. On that day, it was so cold, I rushed straight inside with my daughter. The guard was in the foyer, and also in the foyer were all these boxes of mat sauce, Passover, of course and also tins of white paint, because at Passover, everyone touches up the paintwork around their doors and porches. And for some reason, there were stacks and stacks of lavatory paper. I bought a lot of dairy products, milk, white cheese, cream, fruit, yogurts, cherry, peach, not kiwi, I don't like kiwi. I bought eight chicken thighs. My family likes roast chicken thighs with a sauce made of soya, honey, olive oil, and garlic. I bought potatoes, I do them with rosemary and butter. I bought tomatoes, cucumbers, carrots, lemons. There were four or five people in front of me at the checkout. Friday is always crowded, especially Passover Friday. It came to my turn and I put all the stuff out of the trolley onto the belt. The woman on the cash till was Russian, maybe 60 years old, very beautiful bone structure and very polite, even though she didn't speak fluent Hebrew. All the stuff had gone through. I had already taken my visa card out of my wallet and I put it in my pocket because I knew I'd be in a hurry when it came to paying. I remember I took my visa card out of my pocket. My daughter was standing on my left helping the lady pack the carrier bags. I pulled out the visa card and at that moment the bomb went off. It wasn't as loud as I would have thought a bomb would have been. I turned round, all the lights went out, and all the glass, all the way along the front of the shop, shattered. And, 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 and this, this is what saved me. This is what saved all of us inside the shop. The whole air was filled with millions and millions of flakes of shredded lavatory paper like a blizzard. And the paint pots, remember the paint pots I told you about? They split open and a fountain of white paint covered half the shop. Well, I, I thought a bomb would have been louder. I thought it must have been a hand grenade and terrorists were going to come in with machine guns. All of this went through my mind in a split second. An Arab worker led us out the back of the shop through the storage entrance, and on our way we passed all these figures moving through the aisles, and they were covered in white paint. Completely white, like ghosts, like a Fellini movie, utterly grotesque. I got back to the car and then I thought, look, oh, I've left all my shopping at the checkout. I, I can't, get out of, can't get over how foolish I was. I, I went back, but instead of going back in through the storage entrance, I climbed up these steps again and came to the front of the shop and I saw... Then I... Then I ran back, of course. I told my daughter we still needed something for supper. We went to another supermarket and we could hear nothing but sirens from the police cars and the ambulances and we bought the whole lot of stuff all over again. And I was shaking all the way there and all the way home and I kept telling myself I must be brave because my daughter lives alone in Tel Aviv and I thought I must set an example and not appear afraid. I heard later about the four Arab women selling herbs and fruit. A young Arab girl, the suicide bomber, went up to each of them in turn 
and whispered in their ears. They got up quickly and vanished. The Jewish flower sellers remained. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we start late, so I guess we can have like 10 minutes of uh, Q&A and discussion, and then we will have a break afterwards. So we are now open the floor. Yes, Kevin. So, uh, two questions. Uh, so the first one is for Nicholas. Uh, you, I've seen, well, actually from what I've seen yesterday and today, I found out that you've got a lot of clips that is actually from uh, filmed by the BBC. So I wonder if you think BBC plays an important part in your career, as well as to shaping the tricycle theatre as what it is today. The second question is for Robin. I want to know what do you think about uh, where the National Theatre, the audience of the National Theatre has changed since the period when you work at there uh, with Michael Gambon and Simon Russell Bean? That's the two question. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Um, uh, the, the BBC really has been wonderful in disseminating what we did, but none of it did we ever expect the BBC to do. It's always been that when we finished it, um, someone from the BBC has come and said, we'll do this, or we've found a production company that wants to do it and then have sold it to the BBC. In the case of the Stephen Lawrence, um, they came to us and felt that they really must do it. And that production, um, Neville Lawrence, the father, was asked on, on television a few years ago what he thought had most changed since the... Um, murder of Stephen Lawrence and he said uh, what had caused that change and he said he thought the play was a massive contribution because so many people had seen it and um, if it had just been confined to the tricycle it would never have done that so that's the answer I mean I've loved that it's gone the Sebrenitsa play was on the BBC World Service and the Nuremberg one was is wonderful as far as I'm concerned because it went to people around the world. But that's been the good thing about the BBC. I just say, preempt Rob, Robin very quickly, just say, I've just done two productions at the National. It's completely changed. Rufus Norris has a policy of getting people in the tickets of all colours and, and such a diverse audience. The only problem is the ticket prices are much too high. If you please answer the question, really. And of course, well, if only more plays like Nick's had been on at the National Theatre, it would have changed quicker. <laughs> but it hasn't changed at the opera. You can go to the Royal Opera House and not see a single face in the audience which isn't white middle class. And it hasn't really changed at Chichester. There are a number of theatres where it hasn't really changed, but there are, there are seeds of change at the National Theatre, and that is... But again, I mean, you know, your play was put on in, in a space in the... It wasn't put in one of the theatres, was it? No, I mean, the second play, the first play, the, the ISIS play went to the National. The, the second, they hadn't got room for. They said, we can't do this play, we love it, but we, we're scheduled up and you need to do it quickly. And I said, well, I can find a West End theatre to do it. And we were given a West End Theatre for free, but the National spent all the money doing it. So it was a National Theatre production. They put themselves behind it, and they've tended to do that. They also have the most wonderful policy, I think, that by 2020, 50% of everything you see on stage will be with, by, and will have women in it. And they're committed to that. If I could tell one... one other little story about When State Affair, the play that I wrote in 2000. When it opened in Liverpool, uh, Max told me with great delight that a record number of people had walked out. 
and he had a notebook like this. And he said, and this is how they went. There were the one, then the two, then three people all at once went, and then a two, then two more, then another single, another single, then three more, then two more, then another three, and then two more people after that, which made 27, which is, which is a record. And um, I thought, oh God. No, of course, what I later discovered was that Rita Sue and Bob too, they made a film of it. And it was quite jokey, the film. And people came to Rita, Sue and Bob to expecting to see a comedy. When in fact, it's a very, very bleak play. The last two scenes of Rita, Sue and Bob II are two of the bleakest plays in the modern canon. So they thought a state affair was going to be <coughs> the funny bit of the evening. But of course, it was even grimmer than Rita, Sue and Bob II, so even without the speech about the woman's scalp. So um, uh, they started to leave. And I was sitting at the back going, oh, born to Turkey. And um, anyway, I, I was sort of a bit sort of red-faced and strange afterwards. And one of the actors came up and said, um, but didn't you see the people at the front? They were all crying and they, 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 were, they could hardly clap because they were crying. And she said, there's four people who want to see you in the foyer. So I went, okay. And there were four big issue salesmen uh, Big Issue is a magazine we give out for the homeless and all the proceeds go to homeless people. And I said, we just want to say thank you because for the first time ever, people like us have been put on a stage and these are voices we can believe in. So we just wanted to say, God bless you, thanks. So, um, yeah, there's, a, there's something about documentary theatre which really gets to people and encourages people to come back to the theatre. And the sort of work that Nick does is going to make people come back to the theatre because, and it's going to change the nature of the audience. And as I said, it's going to change the nature of listening because you feel involved with it in a way. I mean, when we watched Shawcross yesterday, it was absolutely pulverising. You couldn't fail but be totally and completely captured by it. Your life is suspended in that moment. There's nothing about it you don't believe. And therefore, the artifice has disappeared. Therefore, you feel your life is completely subsumed in the drama for that moment. And if you can do it there, then you can get people to come back to the theatre all the time. Robin's done what was said yesterday, I think you said yesterday, verbatim theatre has to give a voice to the voiceless. And they know best. That boy, Paul, who lived in a pile of leaves and two blankets in the corner of a disused garage, uh, like Nick, State Affair was invited to the House of Lords. Uh, Derry Irvin, who was the Lord Chancellor, his wife was a social worker in Glasgow. And she thought the play was really, really important and should be heard by a mixture of MPs, politicians, people from big industry. And I felt really proud that not me, but Paul, Paul's voice, this man who lived in a pile of leaves, Paul's voice was being heard in the river room of the House of Lords. And I thought that was really important. And that's what documentary theatre can do. It can make those voices, which would never normally be heard, have a really potent value in society. Okay, I think like, yeah, time is up. Sorry, just for one question. Uh, if you have any question, please feel free to ask during the break time. And uh, what time is it now? Let me check. Now is... Uh, 11.40 and the next session will begin at 12. Uh, we'll see you around then. And we'll, be in, we'll be there in the yes, place. Yes, yes, yes. Just ask us because it's unfair that we've talked yeah. so much. I'm sorry. Yeah. But if you want to ask anything, please yeah. do. But thank you, Nick, and thank you, Robin, for this wonderful, wonderful speech today. Thank you.